Hey guys, welcome back to the Fearless Home Gardening channel where we give home gardeners the information and support they need to start a home garden fearlessly. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Today we're gonna to be talking about organic gardening, pests, and the organic methods you can use to control them. Once again, there is a lot of information in this video, so go ahead and grab your notebook and let's get into it. So I garden organically. No, I'm not a certified organic farmer or anything like that yet, yet. But I do garden using basic organic garden principles and that's what we're gonna be teaching on this channel. So basically, in terms of gardening, as I'm sure most of you already know, the term organic means without the use of synthetic fertilizers, amendments, or pesticides. Basically, true organic gardening views humans and the environment as one whole system or entity that's dependent on all of its different parts to thrive. If you're poisoning your environment or your garden with toxic chemicals and depriving your garden of what it organically and naturally needs, you're also poisoning and depriving yourself. That brings us to the subject of pests in your garden, because you might be saying, well, if I garden organically, aren't I going to have a lot of pests in my garden? Aren't my plants gonna get eaten by all the bugs since I'm not allowed to use pesticides? Now to be clear, the New Jersey Master Gardener Program also classifies weeds and larger critters as pests as well. Yeah, I know, I couldn't help myself and I went ahead and read a little bit in my upcoming Master Gardener course, I was pretty excited. But for the sake of time, we'll just be talking about the buggy pest today. Just so you know, some of the practices that we talk about today can also be used to minimize weeds and critters as well. So, now that you know what organic gardening is, let's talk about how to keep those buggy pests out of your garden organically. First, let's just be honest, pests are going to happen. Seriously, it's just a part of gardening. However, there are a few things that you can do that will not only keep the bugs and weeds and critters to a minimum, but that will also enhance the beauty of your garden as a whole. Here we go. Number one, regularly monitoring your garden. This is one of the best ways to control unwanted pests. Plus, it's also a really good excuse to have to be out in your garden every day. I've mentioned this before, but a tomato hornworm can literally decimate an entire tomato plant in 24 to 48 hours. Caterpillar eggs, if they're not removed because you didn't go out into your garden, can turn into a much bigger problem very quickly. So number one is to always go out and check on your garden. Think about how much joy you get being out in the garden. By you going out and checking on your garden, you're not just getting joy and happiness out of it, but the plants are also being protected. See, this is the first example of organic gardening being a holistic practice and benefiting all involved, except for the eggs, of course, and the pests. But trust me, there is no shortage of pest eggs or pests or buggy pests there are plenty of other places for them to safely eat and grow other than my garden. I'll be honest though, it does kind of bother me like getting rid of them, but it you gotta do what you gotta do. After you find what you think is a pest in the garden, make sure to do some research and correctly identify what it is you're seeing. A lot of things like ladybug larvae can be easily mistaken for something else. So always make sure that you correctly identify what you think you need to get rid of. Number two, is to simply just remove them by hand. Yeah, just grab your garden gloves and pull those suckers off. If you have chickens, you can go ahead and throw the caterpillars in with them. They love them. But if not, submerging the pests in a bucket of soapy water usually does the trick. I literally hate that part, but they, if, like, if they're just moved to another area of the yard, they're going to find their way back to your garden. You have to get rid of them. Number three, use an organic spray or chemical. I know this can be really confusing, but having an organic garden does not mean that you can't use any chemicals at all if the pests remain a problem. However, any use of organic pesticides should always be used as a last resort. It can be a hard decision to make at first, but trust me, after putting in months of time and work and care into a garden, only to have it devoured by pests will have you reaching for anything that can save your crops. Sometimes stronger measures just need to be taken. Using chemicals on your garden isn't necessarily going to get rid of all of the pests, but it definitely will help to keep them to a minimum and keep them more manageable. And number four, another way to organically keep pests to a minimum is to implement companion planting and crop diversity. 
by planting flowers and herbs that will bring in beneficial bugs and also deter pests. A lot of these beneficial bugs will either deter or devour the pests that are in your garden. We talked about some of the herbs and flowers that we'll be growing in a previous video. Check it out right there if you'd like. Crop diversity and companion planting literally just confuses pests that depend on either odor or appearance to find their food. A tomato hornworm is less likely to find your tomato plant if you plant basil next to it because the scent given off by the essential oils of the basil help hide the tomato plant. Which brings me to another point I wanna make. Now, there's a very common misconception that companion planting also means that two separate types of plants grown next to each other will somehow help improve the taste of one another. Let me explain what I've been taught. Now for the record, and again, to be completely transparent like I always try to be, I am going to mention some scientific studies here. I have not read these studies yet personally myself. However, the information I have learned about these studies came from a very reliable educator that I know. You're more than welcome to look at these studies personally if you'd like, but I will just trust my source. Basically, from what I understand, these two studies show that two different plants cannot communicate with each other to help improve their DNA as far as taste or growth habits. That's not saying that plants don't communicate with each other. They absolutely do. Trees can communicate with each other and so can other plants within the same family. But planting basil next to a tomato will not improve the taste of the tomato. It may, however, help the plant to survive and produce fruit by bringing in beneficial bugs like bees to help with pollination, while also helping to deter predatory bugs like that tomato hornworm. Doing this will help to ensure that plants will grow healthy and strong, but the taste will be the same. Sorry. Another great example of companion planting is the three sisters method. Now this is an old Native American practice of growing three specific crops close together. First, several corn seeds are planted close together in the middle of a mound. When the corn is about six inches tall, two inches, six inches tall, the beans and squash are then planted around the corn. The three crops benefit from each other and help each other grow healthier and stronger. Again, this has nothing to do with the flavor of what you're growing. The corn simply provides a structure for the beans to climb, eliminating the need for poles. The beans provide extra nitrogen to the soil that the corn and the squash use, since they're both really high nitrogen feeders. And the squash spreads along the ground, blocking out the sunlight and helping to prevent weeds from growing. The squash leaves also act as a living mulch, which creates a microclimate to help retain the moisture in the soil. That, my friends, is the true essence of companion planting and holistic organic gardening. Now, after having said all of that, you also need to be careful because some plants actually exude a chemical substance that inhibits the growth of other plants. How rude. Honestly, I had no idea about this until I recently learned it through the gardening and landscape design course that I'm taking. So I wanted to share that information with you as well. Basically, just always be sure to do your research and use caution when planting specific plants next to each other. For example, fennel should always be planted alone. Beans actually inhibit the growth of onions and broccoli. Carrots inhibit the growth of dill and potatoes inhibit the growth of tomatoes, squash, sunflowers, and raspberries. Okay, that is more than enough information to throw at you all in one day. If you've learned something from this video, please do me a favor, give it a thumbs up that helps me not only know that you enjoyed the video, but it also tells YouTube that you enjoyed the video as well. And then they'll help show it to and suggest it to other people who need to learn stuff like this. Also, feel free to share this video on social media or with anyone who you think might get some benefit from it. Just share the knowledge. Don't forget to join us over on Facebook in the Fearless Home Gardeners Facebook group. We're a group of gardening friends from all over the world sharing our gardens, our accomplishments, funny memes, and we're also asking questions and sharing our knowledge and basically just growing together. I'll see you over there. Just remember guys, be kind to yourselves, be kind to each other, be fearless in life and be fearless in your garden. Thanks so much for joining me. See you soon. By the way, I wanted to let you guys know, I also started my very first class in the Master Gardener program last night. Uh, the classes are about two hours long. They're every Wednesday right now and they're via Zoom. So basically for the first class, we just went over, you know, the etiquette for Zoom and 
how the online classes work, what the assignments are gonna be, when they're due, that kind of thing. And they gave us just like a small taste of what the classes are gonna be like. So we went over some information on plant names. I have my notes down here, that's why I'm looking down, I'm sorry. Um, and we took some notes on, you know, um, the Latin names of plants and the benefits of using those names as well as the you know the cultural requirements for for plants in each specific area and we went over some of the geological features of new jersey and how northern new jersey is so much different from southern new jersey which is more southern new jersey is more coastal the reason behind that from what i understand now is the top half of new jersey during the ice age was literally under two miles of ice while the south half of new jersey was underwater so that is why there's so much of a big difference in the landscape and the geological structures in New Jersey, which I thought was just actually pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so that was, you know, just my information on my first Master Gardener program. I did tell you guys that I would be sharing the information of what we go through in each class. So I did just want to touch on that and let you know just what the first class was about and, you know, how we, what we talked about and what we went over. So that was it. That's it for today, guys. Have a good one. Number one, regularly, regularly, number one, regularly monitoring, I can't say regularly, dang it. Use an organical, organical. If I garden organically, aren't I going to have a lot of pets? Not pets, pests.